This is Tell Me What to Read, powered by Booktopia. I'm Nick Wasilia, and today I'm back over the Zoom once again and sitting down for another book chat. And this time, uh, this podcast is coming out where at the time I'm recording, we're in the middle of July 2022, which is Crime Month here at Booktopia. And to finish the month off, I'm sitting down with Australian crime podcast royalty uh, in Emily Webb. She's a Melbourne-based journalist, author and podcaster. Her books include Angels of Death and Suburban True Crime, Australian Cases You'll Never Forget and Some You've Never Heard Of, which came out in May this year. And for our audience, of course, she has also co-hosts the popular Australian True Crime podcast, but you also hosts the podcast Killer Content, Inside the Crime Writer's Mind. Emily, welcome to Tell Me What to Read. Thank you, Nick. I'm delighted to be here. It is so great to have you. You're very welcome. And first of all, congratulations on uh, Suburban True Crime, which came out in May. I love the the description you have for this book, which and I and I want to kind of just quote it to you if I can. Contemporary cases, as well as some shocking historical murders you've probably never heard of, Suburban True Crime proves that you shouldn't say it could never happen here. Yes, Whoa. thank. You. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a lot. I mean, it's. Mm. It's been great to have this book out. Um, You know, books take a long time and I had written a few previous books that actually went out of print before I started Australian True Crime Podcast and I would always get people saying, where can I get your books? Where can I get your books? I'm like, I'm going to have to update those books and add some new chapters and I'm particularly interested for myself about true crime I haven't heard of because I and pretty across true crime, I would say. So that's where my uh, passion and interest lies. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we there is something that I think is so fascinating about true crime. And that is, you know, and this is why it comes out in, in books like yours and that, you know, there is no happy ending for a lot of these. These are very real stories and often there is no catharsis. The killer does often get away. What's the reaction kind of been like to, to stories like this? Um, and crime in general? Yeah, so generally the reaction is of great interest to people. Uh, A lot of people will say, I didn't know this happened, especially as I focus a lot on suburban crime, in particular ones around where I lived. And I often get comments about, I never knew that happened. Or when I meet people, especially at live shows or get contact um, through my socials or the podcast socials, they actually talk about a personal connection to this. And I have met a number of uh, the families um, of the cases that I've written about. And I think with true crime, it should never be forgotten that, yeah, this is real. It's not, it's not entertainment. Mm. It's, you know, people are very interested in true crime. Understandably, I've been interested in it since I was, you know, a teenager because I'm fascinated about investigations, what happens and what the ripple effect is. But yeah, it's like people shouldn't forget that this, this has impacted real people, even historic Mm. crimes, this really happened. And I think when you dive into the research or, you know, I read inquest files from the public records office of Victoria, it's living, breathing stuff. It's like, yes, these people have passed away. Many people involved are no longer around, but it's there in black and white. And it's, it's really um, quite heartbreaking a lot of the time. And it Mm. it gives me a bit of a chill, to be honest. Mm. I want to kind of ask about these particular crimes that you mentioned in your in your latest book, because obviously there's a lot of like, like you say, there's there's a lot of stuff here that you, that uh, some of these cases are very hard to believe, except they happen. These are these happened on the streets, you know, of, of Australian suburbia, um, like your normal cul-de-sacs and everywhere in between. What stood out in these cases that really also, you know, compelled you to bring them to the page? Mm. So my particular interest is um, unsolved crimes, Mm. especially also the uh, crimes that are where people have gone missing and they've been presumed murdered, which Mm. for families who lose a loved one to murder or affected by violent crime, if someone is convicted and punished by being sent to jail, that is in some way a resolution, but not, you know, not nearly enough for for, Mm. for many people. I mean, it's horrific. But when someone goes missing under really suspicious circumstances or any circumstances, it's really difficult. It's unresolved. Absolutely. There is no body for the family to um, mourn, to visit. 
and there's the questions. And I think that's a particular kind of hell. And another thing that really interested me when I was researching is, you know, the prevalence of family violence. What what we know today is family violence, which has happened for centuries. But, you know, it's interesting to see the way it's described through the decades, you know, the attitudes Mm. towards it, the newspaper reporting. I think I feel like crime is an insight into society Mm. and some of the contributing factors to why it happens. And, And that's my general interest. But certainly cold cases, in particular ones from where I know, like these areas, that that is what really intrigues me. I'd imagine as well that uh, a lot of those, uh, like particularly the cases that are very close to home, they hit differently because these are streets and and places that you know personally. That these are places that, and again, it 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 the it actually re- reiterates just how real it is. I'd imagine. Was there any? I, was, I I anticipate there'd also be plenty of more of other crimes that you had to leave out of the book. Were there any that you had to leave out or you might, you know, even potentially mention in a future book? Were there, what, what's, what were some of those, are there, were there other crimes and stories out there? Yeah, look, there, there, there's many. And I think when you decide what to write about, a, a big consideration for me is trying to talk to people who had um, an involvement in it. Um, I've spoken to people who were impacted by crime, families, Police officers retired. Um, Historic crimes, obviously, you can't do that. So I try my best to go to multiple sources to retell a story. But I I had written a bit about some um, murders of children in the book, and and that that is difficult. But the the period of time that I wrote about those, it it was in the 1970s, and what I I found um, interesting and horrifying was there was a, a seemed to be a run of these and also the way that um, the media reported back in the time before there was a rule, especially in New South Wales, where you um, you could name mm. people under 18. So uh, these crimes were actually perpetrated on children by technically children, so people under 18. In my book, I didn't name the perpetrator because I was just following what is convention now. People can go and search what they want, but I guess for me, I think because I've got a journalism background, I sort of try to stick to that. But yeah, I think I think anything anything that's too well, crime is all disturbing. But I I do sort of try and weigh up. Okay, is this something that um, could be told sensitively and thoroughly? You know, some chapters are shorter than others because some cases just don't have the kind of background because there's just no information or there's very little information and that could be reflective of the time of the investigation the information that was put forward but now what's interesting is we're seeing sometimes 30 years on from a crime some of these crimes are getting solved which is fascinating and also Mm. I think indicative of the fact that things change over the years you know relationships change allegiances change and uh, detection methods change. So it takes, you know, someone knowing something and saying, hey, look, I think I should I should tell the police about that. And then it can start the ball rolling again. And I find that really fascinating too about, you know, you know people, um, you know, people's motivations for keeping secrets or not saying something or, you know, how they got involved in something in the first place. I just find it all really intriguing. And I think it's something that we can all relate to because, something that we've heard from on a strange true crime podcast many times from people who are professionals and work in this sphere like forensic psychologists police counselors we often say oh well i i would never do that i could never be involved in that but mm-hmm. under certain circumstances people say that you could be capable of anything you know mm-hmm. it's not just those over there you know under particular circumstances stresses situations well we could all be capable of committing an act that is against the law. Do you, do you think that is why? It, it's, I love that you, 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 you've touched on this, and I kind of want to ask a little bit more about this if I can, because do you think this is why we, you know, as the, you know, when, in, in the book space and in general storytelling space, there is such an interest with crime? I mean, of course, we've got 
our little our campaign, our Crime Month campaign at the moment. And while the focus of, of that is, of course, predominantly on fiction and thrillers, but there is obviously, it does lean into a truth around crime and an interest that we have in crime, be it fiction, nonfiction. Um, what do you think draws us to stories of crime? Yeah, I think there's the intrigue. Um, there's also, uh, we, Michelle and I get asked a lot about why, why in particular do women seem to be big, big um, consumers, listeners, readers of true crime. Now, there's a few reasons for that. I think, though, there's maybe a deep sense of sometimes trying to work out ways that you can learn more about keeping yourself safe or identifying people, you know, who are tricky. But the thing is, or dangerous, but, but the thing is, you know, you you just don't know. This is the thing. And I also think that crime fiction you mentioned, that is a really interesting way to explore social issues, I think, mm. um, social issues, things that scare us. True crime is the reality. This is stuff that's happened and it's, it is scary. I know for me I'm particularly interested in, you know, how how do people get caught? How do police detect this? Um, and also why, the why of true crime. Why do people do this? Now, sometimes you just never have an adequate answer. I think we do want that, especially the families of people um, and the loved ones of people who are, you know, murdered or impacted by crime or um, assaulted, especially around, um, I know, I think for women in particular, anything around sexual crimes, rape, uh, sometimes I think that, we're just trying to work out in our mind, okay, what is it that we can do? How do we, how do we, um, you know, identify who might hurt us? But, you know, in the discourse recently about um, violence against women, there, there's no real way to do that. It's not on women to keep ourselves safe, really. It, yeah. it's, it's a broader community issue. And um, so that conversation's changed. But I do think that, you know, Crime is definitely a result of societal factors, you know, things that happen, um, mental health, poverty, um, lack of education, lack of access to services, many, many things. I'm not saying those things mean that you will commit crime, but there's a broader conversation around how as a society do we all work together? It's not, iso- you know, it's not isolated. This is something we can't just say, well, that's happened over there. That's none of my business. I feel like there's a big, big question that goes right up to the top of, you know, governments really to try and help communities, you know, be more equitable and for people to have, you know, the things that they need in life to get ahead or to to get by, to live a life they want to live. I'm pretty passionate about that actually. I I work um, in my day job, I work... um, for a mental health services provider. Um, and it's so interesting to see the need out there in the community. And, you know, there is an intersection with interaction with the, um, you know, forensic system, you know, all that stuff. It's really, it's really interesting. And also, you know, it, it needs a lot of support put behind it. Mm. I, I, I love that you talk about different the the you know the, the clear distinction partic- particularly between you know of course crime fiction and the and the reality of true crime i i find this space endlessly fascinating because it, in a way going off your point it's almost like a a mirror to it's a, it's a societal mirror you can look at you can have a look at some of the capabilities and things that people have have actually gone to in the part um, or even so are, are capable of or even in a fictional sense of you know trying to address hey there's a problem here we need to do something about this yeah. um, it's an endlessly fascinating space and and I love that you you and you guys often address it on your podcast on Australian true crime you talk about all these topics and I want to ask you a bit more about the podcast if I can yeah, um, sure. if you do with Michelle how, how on earth did that happen how did that <laughs> story start <laughs> well yeah we uh it is a question I get asked a lot because, yes, how does someone like me, I was like a, you know, little like comms person, was a journo, um, end up being interviewed by Michelle Laurie and then we do a podcast. So I first met Michelle when she she had read um, one of my books, I think, yeah, it was about 2016 maybe, I think, and I got this email from Michelle Laurie. Oh, I've read your book. I love it. Would you like to come down and chat to me? She was doing a podcast at the time 
called the Nitty Gritty Committee, which were conversations with different people. And I was like, is this a joke? Like, is this real? <laughs> um, and and I went down and we just, yeah, got on, love talking true crime. We're on the same wavelength. And I had actually thought for a while, oh, I'd love to do a podcast, but how do you do a podcast? I'd been listening to podcasts for quite a while when there weren't that many available on Apple, you know, on the podcast app, but I, I was really into it. I love audio, love radio. And then a few weeks later, Michelle emailed me and said, hey, do you want to do a true crime podcast together? I'm like, yeah. Of course I would. And and we are very um, similar in our, you know, views about the kind of true crime that we want to um, present, the kind of interviews we want to do. Yeah, we do touch on a lot of societal issues. And I think our audience has really come on board with that. We get a lot of great feedback. I mean, at the start, you know, um, sometimes people are like, well, just stick to, you know, serial killers and um, cases and stuff, which, hey, it's all got its place. But I think we've been able to have some really fascinating guests. And we do have a lot of people who listen to us who work in first responder roles, who um, have been impacted by crime and also work in the spaces where they are doing community services work. And, and, you know, something that we've really learned a lot about is that trauma underpins a lot of stuff in society trauma underpins it and I'm just really grateful that we, we've been going five years now and it's just been an amazing experience like I have learned so much we have met incredible people and we love being able to give like an opportunity a platform for people to share their lived experience or we can find out things we want to find out from investigators or um, people who work in um, industries that intersect with crime it's it's endlessly fascinating and an absolute privilege. I can't believe I get to do it, actually. It's really amazing. Mm, well, you're absolutely right. And I, I love as well that you mentioned the actual podcasting space and the transformation of that space in the last five years as well. Um, because I don't get the opportunity to say this to, you know, like particularly in this particular subject, I've been really interested when it comes to the crime podcast. You know, you look at the back of podcasts like, you know, The Teacher's Pet and the fact that it's reopened uh, even, you know, de- actual true crime, uh, you know, things as well. Um, do you actually think off the back of, you know, the points that you make, but also, you know, podcasts like that becoming more and more common that actually podcasts that even may actually become a, a tool, you in know, in, in a say, as, in a sense as well for bringing awareness and solving, you know, crimes that were previously cold cases, but now have new lights shed on them? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think that the power of podcasting is that, you know, it's very equitable, but also with that equitable, I don't know if that's the right word, also with that uh, fact that basically anyone can do a podcast, right? It's, it's true. And that means you've got a big range of stuff happening. So I think there's also, you know, there's that conversation about ethics and podcasting coming up mm. and, and also having the awareness. Like it's different in America, I guess. They've got different rules, but certainly you know, there's things you can't do on a podcast in Australia. Like as we saw with Teacher's Pet, they took it down when Chris Dawson was charged with murder, they took it down. Like that's because we have laws that you can't, you know, have Mm. anything that would be contempt of court. I think that it absolutely has the power to bring awareness to things that haven't had awareness before. So, for for instance, there are cases that predate the internet, of course. So it's very hard to find information and families often need need to be able to raise awareness. A lot of families and friends do great advocacy on social media, but podcasting as well allows them a space to tell their story. If there's nothing happening in an investigation, it can bring, um, it can get across to the ears of maybe people who haven't heard about that case for a while or maybe know something, maybe they don't read a particular newspaper or they don't watch the nightly news. We know that the way people consume media has really changed. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we have it on demand. I listen to podcasts. I watch streaming. um, I do listen to, you know, um, radio, um, but a lot of people don't listen to it as it happens. They are getting their information at a time that's convenient to them. So I think podcasting really creates an incredible space to say, hey, let's have a look at this, you know, let's do some digging here. Let's talk to people. 
Um, sometimes people are like, what's a podcast? It's great, you know, but they love obviously <laughs> the result that it brings. Um, I think it's in a very exciting space, but there also has to be that awareness that, you know, you've got to be responsible with it. Um, and there's a big, there's a broad, there's a broad church of true crime podcasts. Like there's, mm. you know, um, things like the teacher's pet and you know, some of the stuff that's produced by Wondery and the LA Times. I really like their podcasts. Like news organisations are doing great stuff, but equally there's amazing podcasts being done by people. There's one that I love called The Fall Line that's done by two women and they really focus in on very underreported cases, often of people, um, victims from marginalised communities, underrepresented communities, and they do an amazing job. So I think it's it's just the opportunities are endless. But, you know, I think there's that conversation changing about, okay, how do we do this? It's not entertainment, okay? It's not, you know, it's it's not just entertainment. It's not passive, passive entertainment at all. Mm. It's a sharing of information, kind of. It's like a, yeah. it's a, it's a communication. It's a like a responsibility. Yeah, it's um, journal. More, it's journalism. Too. It's journalism. Yeah, Correct. it's absolutely. You don't have to be like a you know trained and graded journalist, but it, but it is um, presenting information where you need to be mm. mindful and and um, respectful, but also, yeah, you're you're telling a story. You're presenting information, and it is journalism. Mm. absolutely absolutely and it is such an interesting space to keep watch of and and particularly you know uh you know with podcasts like yours um i'm aware we are running out of time but i'm curious you've got of course australian true crime killer content as well um talking inside the crime uh, writer's mind what's up next for you what's uh what's the what's the next few months look like wow yeah the next few months you know they're busy they're rolling along i mean as well as uh, the podcast and and work i've got two teenagers so they keep me really busy mm. um so i'm always you know i'm typical of you know people in my situation we're juggling a lot of balls trying to do stuff that interests us pay the bills pay the school fees all that kind of stuff mm. um so i think I would like to explore writing another book because uh, there are, as you said earlier, there are a lot more things I would like to write about and, and put the feelers out to see if I can find um, families and other people to talk to. Um, but, yeah, it's just it's been a busy year. It's gone by <laughs> in a flash. Um, the podcast, you know, Strange True Crime, we keep rolling. We've got still lots of amazing content ahead and killer content where I speak to authors um, which I started in lockdown and is a bit of a passion project. And it's been actually great for me in terms of learning more about producing podcasts and editing. Mm. I, I My editing skills are getting a lot better. I, I did not know how to edit at all until the lockdown. And um, I had to learn on the hop. So there's, there's those great things that you learn from podcasting. But yeah, I, I think I'm just curious about, yeah, exploring maybe another book, but also just... I don't know. I don't know what's going to be next, really. It just feels like the end of the year is going to be upon us soon and wow, that's it. <laughs> you're absolutely right. It always it always flies by when you're when you're in the middle of it and doing everything. Well, whatever you do get up to and wh- whichever new episodes you drop with both killer content and uh, Australian true crime, I'm going to be chomping at the bit to, Thank you, to catch them out a bit more. Um, to finish off with our show, we always like to finish by by talking about books. We always encourage our guests to bring books along, and I know that you've brought a couple of books along uh, for us. What uh, what books have you been reading and enjoying lately? Well, I recently read uh, The Tribute by John Byron, an Australian oh, author, yes. and yes. I've actually spoken to him for Killer Content. It's coming up soon. Um, I I really found this an extremely fresh take on crime fiction, really different, quite staggering I mean it's hard to talk about it without giving away some spoilers but (laughs) I found that it made my mind work about a lot of societal issues as we were talking about especially around the treatment of women by men male violence male privilege I guess we could say and also just a fascinating police procedural and a bit of a medical procedural because it's a bit of a combination. Have you read it, Nick? I I have not as um like I've only been able to ch- uh, like touch on it a bit. But we the, the benefit of us being here is that we get to see a book do the rounds, uh-huh. and we have a lot of crime 
buffs here in the office and uh, Ben Hunter, our, our fiction category manager, um, as well as um, Sarah McDooling, um, who, you know, they they are the crime. They go for anything that, that is, that is crime. And this book, it turned a lot of heads in our office. Um, and not, not even, even before it was, cause it was, you know, it was shortlisted for the Victorian uh, premier's literary award for an unpublished yeah. manuscript as well. So it was already turning heads even before it, you know, it, it officially came out. Um, and so it was it, the you know, examining that space, examining kind of the, the, you were touching on it a lot, but that examination of, of just how it re how it refocuses crime fiction was what really got them excited about this book. Mm. Um, it was such a, that they just found it so, wow, a refocuser. Yeah. yeah. And there was a moment in it uh, where I was like, whoa, I, I need to speak to John to work out how <laughs> did he write this? What was going on in his mind? It was quite staggering. But he, what's interesting about John is he did do some um, some time at uni um, studying medicine. He didn't become a doctor. But so there's this very interesting stuff woven in about anatomy, about this uh, book called The Fabrica, which I never knew anything about. And then also, And then also it's a really solid police procedural with, you know, like a lead detective, his sister, his wife, and this hunt for this serial killer in Sydney. But, wow, I, it's just read it, everyone, because mm, it will, yes. I, I am a massive rap for this book. Oh, I love it. And I'm glad that you're, you're singing its praises because uh, from every single person who, has, who I know who has read it has gone, you need to read this because it just recontextualizes and re-examines what it is to do it for, for crime novels. Definitely. Um, you've brought a couple of other books as long as well. I have. I have. Now, this is a true crime pick, and it's Banquet, The Untold Story of Adelaide's Family Murders by Debbie Marshall. Now, I've, I'm a big, uh, big reader of Debbie Marshall's work. She is a thorough investigative journalist, incredible true crime writer. This book is really, for me, it, it's, it's what true crime should be. I would, if I, only I could write something like that. But Debbie Marshall has gone in deep, deep into the really shocking murders in Adelaide called the family murders. Um, you know, a lot of uh, people will have heard about the fact that, you know, that young men and, and a teenage boy were murdered. Uh, one of them was actually the son of a newsreader in Adelaide called Rob Kelvin, a boy called Richard Kelvin. There's, uh, these have never been resolved, though there is someone in jail for the murders, uh, Bevan, Bevan Spencer von Einem is in jail. Now he is being convicted of, of murders. And there is though this really, it's believed there's this network of conspiracy of um, high ranking people who were involved in some very, very dark stuff. And Debbie Marshall did a podcast and a, a series, Frozen Lies, where she uh, un unveiled things that people didn't know about. I mean, she's gone for it. She's gone to court to lift suppression orders. She's looked in places that no one else has looked. And Banquet is the book that goes further on from this and it is startling. It, it, it's disturbing. It's a, you know, it's a heavy, dense read. But for me, um, I believe that it's an important read and the work that Debbie has done is incredible she's gone where some people have tried to go where she's gone but she's gone there and um it's it's unbelievable oh, yeah it sounds like an absolutely fascinating book and you know particularly one if you if you are looking to kind of examine that true crime space um, mm. i'm very curious about your final read oh yes now this yes <laughs> this is a book that i read every year it's actually heartburn by nora efron it's um I've got this very beloved copy in my hands as we record. It's this little paperback. I absolutely love this book. Uh, Nora Ephron was an extraordinary, funny writer, movie maker, and this book, Heartburn, it's a fictionalized account really of her marriage breakdown to her. I think it was her second husband, Carl Bernstein. Carl Bernstein of the uh, you know all the president's men, Watergate investigators, um, journalists. And, yeah, so the character Rachel, she writes cookbooks. She's pregnant, having their second child, and she discovers that her husband Mark is having an affair with this woman called Thelma. And 
this is what happened to Nora Ephron, essentially. The book mm. is so funny and, 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 you know, heartbreaking in parts, but she intersperses like recipes that uh, Rachel cooks in it. And it's, it's so witty. Like Nora Ephron just has this, had this, sorry, Nora Ephron uh, passed away a few years ago. Just this incredible way of connecting with her audience. I think whether it's movies, books, but this is, it's a, it's a, it's a, I just read it every year and I just, I love it. I absolutely love it. And yeah, it's one of my most precious books. I love it. I love that you're talking about this one. Like she's amazing. Like the, the oh, you have to look at the movies that she, that she's done um, and that, and that style of humor, but it's also kind of, there's a black edge to it as well with a lot of it. I'm very curious. Why is it, you mentioned when you were, you you're bring it, you you reread it every single year. Why? I'm curious. Yeah. I, I, I have these comfort reads. I actually mm. re- reread The Secret Diary of Adrian Mole as well, probably every couple <laughs> of years, because that was quite a significant read for me. I just, there's something about, I'm not, um, so I, I tend to read a lot of crime fiction, a lot of true crime, but I do delve into other areas. But sometimes I feel like comedy, sometimes, well, it does have a bit of a, um intersection with, with, you know, dark kind of fiction. I feel like I like comedy and I like crime. So it's interesting, but I, I'm just really intrigued by trailblazing women like Nora Ephron, who, mm. you know, have, have really paved the way for a lot more women in entertainment, in books. But this, it's just the pace of her writing. I just, you can visualise what she's saying so much. And I, I, I don't know, I just get lost in it. I find it comforting. I find it mm. comfort reading. You know those comfort reads. Did, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, what's your comfort read, Nick? Do you have a comfort oh, read? Oh, God, there is a, I do have some, you know, a couple of comfort reads. I often go back to classics. I often find myself going back. So, you know, some occasionally like, you know, a really good John Steinbeck book, mm. like from the from the past. Or even I did, re- I did during the first lockdown, I really got into Laura Jean McKay's book, uh, The Animals in That Country. Obviously, it's wow. a, more, a bit more sci-fi than, uh, than kind of anything, but just that space the, the, and the way she wrote, I just found so endlessly fascinating. But I do, sometimes I do like a really good, you know, crime fiction. I'm currently enjoying uh, No Country for Old Men, Ooh, the Cormac wow. McCarthy book, which is just, I, I, of course, first got into it with the movie. Uh, mm. with the, the the you know Academy Award winning movie, but just the the writing and the and the place that Cormac McCarthy puts you in is just amazing. Often, yeah. weirdly enough, I go for really intense stuff or really yeah. all that stuff. I know I'm the same, and I think that the the real skill and genius of Nora Ephron is it's you look at it and this is like a it's you know not a super long read, but it's so perfectly constructed and you get so much and there's real, yeah, there's heartbreak, there's humour. She just had this ability to just blend all that feeling and I think that's why she was so popular and I I absolutely, you know, it takes skill to write something like this. It's not just, oh, it's a bit light and fluffy and then, you know, about her marriage breakdown. It's, you know, it really cuts through and I I can't recommend it enough. Absolutely, absolutely. I could honestly talk to you all day, but unfortunately, <laughs> we have uh, we have run out of time. Emily, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting for, uh, chatting with you today. Thanks, Nick. It's been so lovely to be asked to be on this podcast. Thank you. You're very welcome. And I hope fans also, you know, take the time to check out some of the, you know, the really fantastic true crime books that are out there. You can buy books mentioned today uh, um, in this podcast from booktopia.com.au. And of course, I'll include links to Emma's books and multiple podcast shows, of course, you know, Australian True Crime and Killer Content in the description below. Or you can also head over to Australian True Crime Podcast.com. And we'll be doing a guest episode with Emily over there about uh, true crime books that you should go and get, you should check out to get into the genre. So be sure to head over and check that episode out we'll catch you on tuesday for our next episode where we'll discuss a new monthly series where i chat with our in-house team of experts to discuss the books coming in august 2022 thanks for listening and never stop reading